let's talk about the first parent function that we're going to be looking at today. The first parent function is called the constant function. The constant function. So that's its name. Its formula is going to be f of x equals c. f of x equals c, where c is a real number, where c is a real number. So we know its name, we know its formula, and you need to know the graph. So let's look at the graph of this. Now, for example, let's say we had f of x equals 2 f of x equals 2. This is just going to be a horizontal line. A horizontal line. At y equals 2. So what this is going to look like is once you have your xy plane, you can draw a straight line at y equals 2 make sure it goes through two on the y axis. You draw your line and then you put arrows at the ends. You put arrows at the ends. So that's the constant function. It's always gonna be a horizontal line. It's always gonna be at some number on the y axis. This time it's at f of x equals two. And you do need to know that this line has a zero slope. So the slope of this line is going to be m equals zero because there is no slope, right? It's a flat line. So that's going to be the constant function. It's always going to be f of x equals some real number c, okay? That's always going to be that horizontal line. Okay, the next one I want to talk about is number two. The second parent function we're going to talk about today is the linear function. The linear function. So that's its name. Its formula is going to be f of x equals x. Okay, so that's the formula. Now, if you've ever graphed this before, you know that you get a straight line. So this is gonna be a line with a slope of one, a slope of one. So M is gonna be equal to one. And if you've ever graphed this, you know that Y is gonna be equal to x, but you can also write this as y equals 1x. Whatever number that's in front of x is going to be the slope. So with this linear function, what you have is you have that familiar straight line. It's got a positive slope. So you're going to have a point at 0, 0, but you're also going to have a point at 1, 1, and 2, 2, and 3, 3 and so on and so forth like that. And even with the negative numbers, you're gonna have negative one, negative one, negative two, negative two, negative three, negative three, and negative four, negative four. So those are the points, they go on for infinity, right? And you can draw a straight line through them. And then you wanna put arrows at the ends. So that's the linear function. It's always going to be that straight line with a slope of one. Now, what you'll often see is you'll see the linear function where it might have a slope, like let's say three. So you would have y equals three x, but you would also see a plus b at the end of this. And b would just be the y-intercept. The y-intercept. 
And what this is, is this is gonna be called the slope intercept form. And when you were in algebra one, you graph lines like this. So that's the slope intercept form. Another form you can write it in is AX plus BY equals C. And this is called the standard form. The standard form. And the trick to this is you have X and Y on the same side, but A, B, and C are all gonna be whole numbers. So if you have graph lines before, you've either seen them in slope intercept form or you've seen them in standard form. And the linear function, actually the word linear contains the word line. And that gives you the hint that this is gonna be a line at least when you graph it. So that's number two, that's the linear function. Okay, number three, going up an exponent, the next function is gonna be the quadratic function. The quadratic function. Now, anything that's quadratic is going to have a highest exponent of two. So quadratic just means the highest exponent is two. So anything quadratic, that would be in the form ax squared plus bx plus c, where a, b, and c are real numbers. So since the highest exponent is two, you're gonna have an x squared term, you're gonna have an x term, and you might even have a constant term at the very end. And that's what that c is. So that's what quadratic really means. The next thing I wanna talk about is how do you write the function? And the parent function is gonna be f of x equals x squared. That's it just x squared. So how would we graph this? Well, if you've ever graphed x squared before, you know that you're gonna have that vertex at zero, zero at the origin, but you're also gonna have the point one, one. Because if you square one, you get one, right? But you also have two, four, because if you square two, you get four. So we're gonna have a point at two, four way up here. So 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 4, and it mirrors itself on the other side. So if I reflect this across the y-axis, I would have a negative 1, 1, a negative 2, positive 4, which would be up here. And then I would have a negative 3, positive 9, which is off of the graph. So I can't really draw that. But when you do graph this, you're going to try as best as you can to connect the dots in a smooth U shape. So it's going to look like this. That's the best I can draw it freehand. So that's the quadratic function. Now the graph that you get is going to be called a parabola. A parabola. Parabola is the shape of the graph, which is a U shape. So that's the quadratic function. F of X equals X squared. Now, sometimes you'll see me write it as Y equals X squared. And that's the same thing. All I've done is I've replaced f of x with y. And that's permissible. You can do that when you're graphing. So this is the graph y equals x squared. So I hope that makes sense to you. All right, the fourth parent function, 
moving right along here, the fourth parent function is going to be the cubic function. The cubic function. Anything that's cubic is going to have a highest exponent of three. So the highest exponent is three. One way you can write this is ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d. That's the general cubic form. Notice that the highest exponent is three. So now when we write the function, we're gonna have f of x equals x cubed. That's the parent function. That's the simplest form of any cubic function. So how would I graph this? Well, we're basically cubing the numbers now, right? So if I wanted the y value for one, then I would cube that to get one. So I've got a point at one, one, but I could also cube the number two and I would get eight, which is beyond the scope of the graph, like somewhere up here probably. And the negative numbers, when I cube those, they're gonna stay negative. So if I cube a negative one, that's negative one times negative one times negative one which is one times negative one, which is negative one. These numbers are gonna stay negative. So I'm gonna get negative one, negative one. I will put my dot right here. And then if I cube a negative two, that stays negative as well. I would get negative eight, which is way down here. So if I was to connect all the points in the graph, I would get this general shape. And then I put arrows at the top and the bottom. That's my cubic function. That's the way it's always going to look. All right. So the main point is f of x equals x cubed. And you have to remember that the highest exponent is going to be 3 to have a cubic function. Anything more, it's not a cubic function anymore. All right, number five. Number five is the absolute value function. The absolute value function. This absolute value function can be written as f of x equals the absolute value of x or I can write it as f of x equals a, b, s of x. a, b, s just stands for absolute value. So how do I graph the absolute value function? Well, for the graph, I'm actually gonna get a V shape. The graph is gonna be a V shape. So how do I get my points? Well, I plug in x equals whatever. So if x is one, then I would get f of one equals the absolute value of one, which is one. f of two equals the absolute value of two, which is two, and so on and so forth. So I'm gonna have a point at one, one, and I'm gonna have a point at two, two, and three, three, and four, four, and five, five. What if I start plugging in negative numbers? Well, let's see. If I plug in a negative one, I'm gonna get the absolute value of negative one, which would be a positive one, right? Since we take that negative, we make it into a positive when we take the absolute value. And then F of negative two, that's also gonna be a positive two because when I take the absolute value of it, I get positive two. So negative one, positive one, that would be right here at this point. And then I would have a point at negative two, positive two, right here. Negative three, positive three, negative four, positive four. And then I draw my straight lines. 
So can you see the V shape now? There we go. And then you put arrows at the ends. So that's the absolute value function. You're always gonna get a V shape, not a U shape, but a V shape. That's totally different from the quadratic function where we had F of X equals X squared. That one would be a U shape, but the one we're doing right now, the absolute value function, this is always gonna give you a V shape. Okay, let's look at number six. Number six is the square root function. The square root function. You've seen a square root before, so it's not gonna surprise you when I say that the function is gonna be f of x equals square root of x. And this is gonna be for x is greater than or equal to zero. So that's gonna be the domain of the function. That means I can include any number that's equal to zero or greater than zero. That means I'm not choosing to put in negative numbers like the square root of negative two, which would be complex. And I'm not gonna do the square root of negative one, which would also be a complex number. But the square root function, it's also important to remember that this is the first radical function that you ever see. This is a radical function. And just like its brother, uh, the cube root, this is also gonna be a radical function. So let's take a look at the graph. When I start plugging in positive numbers, well, like one, but really starting at zero, you start getting your outputs. So I know the square root of nine is three, the square root of four is two. So if I plug in this point, I get one, one. If I plug in this point, I get four, two, which would be right here. And then if I plugged in this point, there would be a nine, three. So kind of over here. And then once you connect the graphs, you'll get that square root function. Now notice the domain really does hold up. Remember that the domain is the set of all X values, the set of all X values, while the range is the set of all Y values, the set of all Y values. If you keep domain and range in mind, you can really start looking at all these functions in a new way. So what would the domain for this function be? What X values do we include on our graph? Well, when we look at X values, I typically look at the X axis right here, this horizontal axis. The only points that I see are for anything zero and greater. So that's why we have a restriction right here for X is greater than or equal to zero. That's the domain of the function. And what you'll find out on the next slide is that when you do the cube root function, its domain does not have that restriction to it. It doesn't need it. It's the set of all real numbers. So let's look at the next slide, number seven. Let's look at the cube root function. So when I write the cube root function, it's f of x equals the cube root of x. The cube root of x. And for this function, the domain doesn't have that restriction. So it's gonna be the set of all real numbers. All real numbers. Also known as capital R. So how do we graph this? Well, the cube root function isn't gonna give us many points. We know that if we plug in zero, we get zero. That's pretty obvious. And if you plug in one, the cube root of one is gonna be one. But then the next perfect cube is eight. And the cube root of eight is gonna be two. 
Likewise, if you look at the negatives, the cube root of negative one is also gonna be negative one. And the cube root of negative eight is gonna be negative two. So now let's plug in all these points. We have zero, zero, which is the origin. And then we have one, one, which would be right here. And then we're gonna have eight, two, which is off the map, but it would be somewhere over here. The next ordered pair that we need to look at is negative one, negative one, which would be right here. That's gonna match up with this positive one, positive one. And then negative eight, negative two is obviously also off the map, somewhere over here. So if we connect all these dots, we get this curve. Make sure you put arrows at the very end. So that's the cube root function. Notice how different it is from the square root function. So going back to our last slide, we saw that the square root function only considers x values that are greater than or equal to zero. But for the cube root function, we have our domain of all real numbers. So we can go less than zero. We can feed in negative numbers and get negative answers. That's why the cube root function looks so different. Okay, the next one we're gonna look at is called the reciprocal function. The reciprocal function. This isn't often seen, but it'll come back in pre-cal. The function is gonna be f of x equals one over x one over x. So we are dividing by x this time. Another way you can write that is f of x equals x to the negative one power. Now the domain is interesting for this. We have the following stipulation, x cannot equal zero. Obviously, because if we let x actually equal zero, then we would be dividing by zero. And we don't want to do that. So the restriction stays true, whichever way you write it. You can't let x equal zero. And what that means is on the y-axis, you're not gonna have a point. But everywhere else, as long as you're not on the y-axis itself, you're actually gonna have a point to this. So how do I graph this? Well, this is gonna be the first graph that is what's called a hyperbola a hyperbola. A hyperbola is like having two U-shapes. It's kind of like having two U-shapes. So it's kind of like having two parabolas. And this hyperbola is going to have a vertical asymptote. This one is going to have a vertical asymptote at x equals zero, also known as the y-axis. So when you look at the y-axis over here, when you graph the hyperbola, there's not going to be a point on the y-axis. And that goes back to that fact that you're actually dividing by zero if you let x be zero. So we're going to have this imaginary dotted line on the y-axis. And the graph is gonna look something like this. If you've ever graphed this before, you know what I mean. There's not gonna be a point on the y-axis. And then going from the first quadrant to the third quadrant of the coordinate plane, you're gonna have something that looks like this. So there's no point that actually gets plotted on the y-axis. Also, it seems to have a horizontal asymptote. Horizontal asymptote. The horizontal asymptote is, you probably guessed it, it's y equals zero, otherwise known as the x-axis. <laughs> 
So there's not going to be any point on the y axis or the x axis. And that's because it has those two asymptotes, a vertical asymptote and a horizontal asymptote. So that's the reciprocal function. You've probably seen that before in a past algebra class. And this pops up in algebra one when you do variation problems. That typically shows up there. Okay. The last 10 parent functions are going to be things that you haven't seen before. Or maybe you have seen them, but they don't show up until algebra two. The first function we're going to talk about is the exponential function. The exponential function. So this function is going to be exponential. The way you graph it is going to be f of x equals a to the x power. This time, x is going to be the exponent and a is going to be the base. So we call a the base and a can never be equal to zero. We'll give that restriction. A cannot be zero. So what does this look like? Well, this is going to be either exponential growth or exponential decay. Exponential growth and exponential decay. You probably heard those terms before, so let's talk about them. So exponential growth kind of looks like this. It starts growing at an exponential rate, but exponential decay is going to start decaying at an exceptional rate, and then it's gonna level off. So it's gonna look like this. So it could look either this way or this way. Now you're gonna have exponential growth if A is greater than zero. Likewise, you're gonna experience exponential decay if your A is less than zero. If your A is less than zero. Actually, let me erase that it's A is greater than one. A is greater than one. And exponential decay is gonna be between zero and one. So between zero and one. So those are the rules for exponential growth and exponential decay. Now let's look at a familiar function that you've probably seen before f of x equals 2 to the x power, 2 to the x power. So you've probably seen this before. Uh, 2 is going to be the base, and x is going to be the exponent. So let's make an xy table. And we'll go from negative numbers to positive numbers. All right. So if you raise two to the negative one power, you get one half. If you raise two to the zero power, anything raised to the zero power is one, so you get one. And then it starts to really get interesting. We're going to have two raised to the first power, to the second power, to the third power, to the fourth power, and to the fifth power. All right, so two to the one power is two. Two to the second power is four. Two to the third power is eight. And then you get 
16 and 32 and so on and so forth. So plugging in these points, I know that negative one is gonna give me one half, zero is gonna give me one, and then one is gonna give me two, two is gonna give me four, three is gonna give me eight. So this is way off the graph right here. And then so on and so forth like that. So the graph is gonna look like this. If I connect the dots very well, good. So then I put arrows at the ends. This would be a form of exponential growth because your base is a number that's bigger than one. But if you had something that was exponential decay, it would look kind of like this, where A is between zero and one. So this really allows for exponential growth. And a lot of things you'll see in life actually follows an exponential growth. Let's look at number 10. 10 is gonna be the last one we'll talk about today. I know you haven't seen this before. This is the logarithmic function. The logarithmic function. This function is going to be the opposite. It's going to be the opposite of an exponential function. And I'll put a star beside that. This is going to be the opposite of an exponential function. The way you write this is f of x. So we start off like we normally do. And then we write the word log, like we're going to cut down a tree and we're going to make it into logs. And then we're going to have an x and then a base b. So b is known as the base. And b has to be greater than zero. So when I'm writing out this function, I'm always going to choose a base b that's bigger than zero. That's my only restriction on this. This function is going to have a vertical asymptote. It's going to have a vertical asymptote. And that's going to depend on what x is, really. The way that you graph this is you're going to have a point at 1, 0. So you're going to have a point right here. And then you're going to have a vertical asymptote on the y-axis. So it's going to come up like that and go like that. The vertical asymptote is the y-axis. It's the y-axis. So it's never going to cross the y-axis. It will get infinitely close to it, but it will never cross it. OK. So that's the logarithmic function. That's the last parent function that I wanted to talk about. Okay, so let's talk about functions in general. A function is a relationship between an input, an input, Let's call it X, where it has a single output, a single output. And for the output, we're going to call that, let's say, Y. So that's the definition of a function. So what a function really says is Y equals F of X. F is what's known as the function, X is the input, Y is the output. You'll often see this written as F dot dot X mapped to Y. So we say X is mapped to Y. Okay. 
All right. So y equals f of x and f of x is the function of x. All right, x is the independent variable. X is the independent variable. Y is the dependent variable. Y is the dependent variable. So that's the difference between X and Y. Since Y is the dependent variable, Y is gonna depend on X. X is gonna determine what Y is, not the other way around. So X, we call it the standalone or the independent variable. And whatever X is, that's gonna influence what Y is. So Y is always gonna depend on what X is when you have a function of X. All right, now a parent function, a parent function is going to be the simplest form. Of any family of functions. So it's only going to be the simplest form. So let's look at a couple of questions from the problem set. From the problem set. We're going to be looking at a few of those questions and that should help you on the classwork. So the first part is name by graph. I'm going to give you a graph and you're going to have to match it to a parent function. All right, the first one is the U shape. Now, if you have a U shape, you generally call this a parabola or a quadratic function. Quadratic function. So you could write quadratic function or you could write f of x equals x squared. That would be the quadratic function. The highest exponent is two that's what gives it that U shape. And then you're gonna have other functions that I'll show you by graph. Let's say you had something like this. Well, since this is a V shape, we know automatically that this is an absolute value function. An absolute value function. So you could write it out in words like this, or you can write it as f of x equals the absolute value of x. So that V shape tips you off that this is the absolute value function. And the last one we'll look at is this. This is the one that we just covered today. This is the exponential function. You can tell because it has that exponential growth to it. So this is the exponential function. Or you could write it as f of x equals a to the x power. So you need to be able to look at a graph and you need to be able to match the picture to the name of the graph. That's the first 10 questions, and that's what those are going to look like. So if I give you a graph, you should be able to tell me what's the name of the parent function and what's the formula for the parent function. And that's that f of x equals whatever. Okay, so you should also be able to identify by formula. So let's say I was to give you f of x equals six or f of x equals square root of x plus two. f of x equals log five x or f of x equals one over 
x minus one. For every formula I give you, you should be able to tell me what the name of the parent function is. So I'll be asking for the name and then I'll be asking for the formula. So for this one, since it's just a number, this is called the constant function. The constant function. That's the first one that we talked about today. F of X equals C, where C is some real number. The next one is the square root function. You know that because it has a square root. And the parent function is f of x equals square root of x. The third one, this is the logarithmic function because it has the word log in it. The logarithmic function is f of x equals log base b of x. So that's the new one that you learned today. That's the logarithmic function. And then the last one, notice that you're dividing by x. So this is the reciprocal, the reciprocal function. And I know it's a lot of functions that I threw at you today, but there are 10 of them that you need to know. And this is f of x equals one over x. And then the last question you'll see is, can you name the function from its family? And parent functions have function families. Get it, the parent and the family? We'll get to that on the next slide. So you should be able to take the formula and give me the name and then what the general formula is or what the formula of the parent function is. That's the part that I put over here. Okay. And then the last one is named by family. So we're gonna have F, G, and H. These are all brothers. All of them are brothers to each other. Get it? Because they're in the function family. Okay, so let's say you have X plus two squared. You have X minus one squared and you have 3x squared plus 1. All of these are brothers. They all come from the same parent. And what is that parent function? That's going to be p of x equals x squared, or the quadratic function. So see how x squared is the most simplest way we can write a family? So we often use the notation p of x when we're talking about a parent function. If x is, or if, if, if f is already taken, we move to p.